I'd like to welcome you all here, uh, particularly those who have come from other campuses in D.C. and from other places in the area. I'm here to introduce someone who really needs no introduction because Professor Peter Kraft is an absolutely renowned scholar of philosophy and philosophy of religion and quite a dynamic speaker. We have the privilege of hearing from him this evening about the pro-life philosophy. He's going to take the pro-life cause and the issue and the argument and approach it from a sound philosophical point of view and get away from a lot of the polarizing political rhetoric that we hear too often in this issue. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor Kraft. Steve and I agree about some things, like introduction should be short. We disagree about other things. He's a Yankee fan. I'm from Boston. <laughs> That's all right. We can agree to disagree. I'm going to try to make this talk fairly short so that there's time for questions and answers afterwards. I'm also not going to give you a formal lecture or read point by point. I've done that in books like this one. I assume that some of you at least have read a book like this, and it would be a species of theft, I think, to make you come out to a lecture to simply do what you can do at home yourself, namely listen to the words of a book. But I will be pulling ideas from the book and looking at them a little more carefully and deeply and slowly and leisurely. This is only a philosophical approach to abortion. Everything that exists, except abstractions like numbers, and even maybe they, have many aspects, many dimensions, many relationships. And certainly abortion, in one sense, is a complex issue in that it has many different uh, aspects and relationships. I do not believe it is a morally complex issue. I agree with Mother Teresa when she says, if abortion isn't wrong, what is wrong? But I'm not going to use that as an argument. I'm going to try to demonstrate it logically. But I'm not going to go into the religious aspect of abortion or the psychological aspect of abortion or the sociological aspects of abortion or the political aspects of abortion or even the legal aspects of abortion except on one point and not the feminist aspects, the gender-based aspects of abortion, though that's relevant too, or even the scientific aspects except again on one point that's essential for my argument. But just going to look at the philosophy and especially the logic of the pro-life argument. It's essentially one argument, but there are many different ways to express it, and I have up here four different ways, which I will explain in a moment. Within philosophy, the division of philosophy that obviously most directly is about abortion is ethics. I will presuppose two things. If you disagree with these two presuppositions, you won't be able to sympathetically follow my argument. But I think the vast majority of people, even the vast majority of philosophers, who are certainly more insane than most people, believe these things. We have a saying in Boston, that's so crazy, only a PhD could possibly believe it. <laughs> Presupposition number one, we can argue about ethics. There's a role for reason and logic in ethics. There's no absolute divorce between truth and goodness, fact and value, logic and morality, reason and will. They're different, granted, but they can interpenetrate. The second presupposition is that if you say that we can reason about ethics, that would seem to necessitate believing that there's something real about good and evil, right and wrong, rights and duties, because we don't reason about our dreams, our fantasies, our personal creations, our purely personal likes and dislikes, our feelings, you can't argue about feelings. If you reduce ethics to feelings, ethics is no longer an argument. You never heard a conversation like this. I feel great. No, you don't. You feel terrible. <laughs> People don't argue about that. Feelings are private. <laughs> Philosophers talk about a fact-value distinction, and that's a valid point. In fact, I'm going to use that point in my argument to try to show that the pro-life argument necessarily has a fact premise and a value premise. But the distinction between facts and values is not total. It is a fact, though not a scientific fact, that there are values and that some things are valuable and some things are not. You can make meaningful statements about values. You can argue about values. We do all the time. If we didn't in fact believe that there was something like objective values, we would never have ethical arguments. We would just fight. People quarrel. They don't just fight, they quarrel. What right do you have to do that? Well, that's an ethical argument. Now, if you didn't believe these two presuppositions, I don't think you would have come here. I think you knew that we were going to talk about abortion, and I think you knew that I was a philosopher. 
So if you didn't think that you could rationally philosophize about a morally controversial issue like abortion, you would probably come here only to get angry. And I suppose some people do things only to get angry, but I assume that that didn't happen at Georgetown. (laughs) The second presupposition that there are objective values means that total moral relativism is false. Maybe there are some things that are morally relative, morally subjective, not objective. But if you think that there's nothing that's objectively right or wrong, you're not going to argue about it. I discovered a very famous 20th century philosopher who explained moral relativism with striking clarity. His name is Benito Mussolini. Unlike Hitler, Mussolini was a philosopher. And here is a quotation from uh, a book of his. Everything I have said and done in these last years, this was after he became Italy's dictator, has been relativism. If relativism signifies contempt for fixed categories and men who claim to be the bearers of some objective immortal truth, then there is nothing more relativistic than fascism. For from the fact that all ideologies are mere fictions... The relativist infers that everyone has the right to create for himself his own ideology and to enforce it with all the energy of which he is capable. That seems perfectly reasonable to me. And therefore, since we probably don't admire Mussolini for anything except the fact that he made the trains run on time in Italy, which is the only reason we're not Nazis today, because that's why the Italian people thought he was God and loved him for a while, and that's why Hitler had Italy as his ally, and that's why Hitler had to delay his invasion of Russia until he bailed Mussolini out in Greece and Yugoslavia, and because of the delayed invasion of Russia, he lost the war. So thank the Italians for not being able to tell time. (laughs) That's from my wife. She's Italian. There may even be a third hidden presupposition in my argument, and we may want to argue about that. And that is that a certain theory in morality, I think, has to be implicitly rejected in order to make sense of the pro-life argument. And that's pragmatism or utilitarianism. Let's define pragmatism and utilitarianism. They're different philosophies in a sense, but they both agree that something like the end justifies the means. That... If you can benefit some people by harming other people, that might be okay. That you calculate goodness or happiness or pleasure quantitatively. And also that people are to be judged by function. That there's no final end. Everything is a means or instrument or function for something else. So if you're not functioning in a complete way, a human way, a rational way, an adult way, a useful way, a social way, a good way, that's terribly important. That's the only thing that's important. What you are is not distinct from what you do. And if you don't do good stuff, well, then you're not good stuff. In other words, the pragmatist or the utilitarian would not understand or not agree with the old adage that you must love the sinner even while you hate the sin. I state those three rather dull presuppositions because I want to be totally fair, uh, complete disclosure, and offer opportunities for arguing against my presuppositions as well as my arguments. One other preliminary, and that's a uh, procedural rule. Who's the onus of proof on? The pro-lifer or the pro-choicer? Well, it depends. If we're talking about history and tradition and a community, and if that community is traditionally pro-life and wants to change to pro-choice, then I think the onus of proof is on the one who wants to change it. But if we're just looking at the thing philosophically and logically in the abstract, I think the onus of proof is on the pro-lifer. Because I think human acts like human beings, ought to be treated as innocent until proved guilty. Similarly, I think the onus of proof is on the theist, not on the atheist, to give some reason for believing that there is a God. If he says, I don't have to give any reason for believing there is a God, you have to give me a reason for believing there's not, he could fairly reply, well then, why not believe in the Loch Ness Monster, or uh, the Abominable Snowman, or Santa Claus? So I accept the onus of proof, And here is my attempt to show why the pro-lifer argues against abortion. The essential pro-life argument has three premises. And therefore, the pro-choice rebuttal 
is of three possible kinds, depending on which of these three premises the pro-choicer accepts. But if all three premises are true, then the pro-life conclusion logically follows. So in order to deny that conclusion, you have to deny at least one of these premises. Notice the structure of the argument. The first premise is factual. It has nothing to do with values. The second premise has to do with a natural value, the value of being a human person. And the third premise has to do with a social value, a conventional value, a legal value. So the second premise is about the natural moral law, and the third is about the positive civil law. First premise says that the life of each individual member of a species, at least of mammal, begins at conception or fertilization. That's when a genetically new and genetically complete individual first comes into existence. You got your genetic code at that moment. That's a truism that was taught in all the biology textbooks in America that were written before Roe v. Wade in 1972. And I haven't been able to find any biology textbook except those written by Christians for Christian schools that repeated that after 1972. Yet the new textbooks did not appeal to a single new scientific discovery to justify their change. It was purely political. I'm not suggesting that the textbooks were written by pro-choicers. I was suggesting that the textbooks wanted to avoid political controversy. So the first premise of the pro-life argument is uh, that all humans are human. Whether they're embryonic humans or fetal humans or infantile humans or young humans or even teenage humans. <laughs> or mature humans, or old humans, or dying humans. Second premise is that all humans have the right to life because they're all human persons. All humans have human nature, whatever that is. They share the human essence. We're all essentially human. We're very, very different from each other, but the way in which we are the same is much more important than the way in which we are different. Now, Here's another philosophical presupposition. A nominalist is a philosopher who believes that all universals are nothing but names. So there is no such thing as human nature. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing as the nature of a chair. We just call all these things chairs because we think in a sloppy way. We should call that Helen and call that Olga, but we don't have time for that, so we call them all chairs. That's counterintuitive. That's not commonsensical. Most people are not nominalists. Most people believe that there is such a thing as human nature and that we all have it. And that makes us all essentially equal. So the universal right to life is a deduction from the most obvious of moral rules. Granted that there is human nature, there's equality in essence among all of us. Therefore, the golden rule or the rule of justice says, since you don't want others to kill you against your will, you ought not to kill them against their will. It's just not fair, not just. Different ways of expressing that. You could deliberately base it on the ontological good of human nature, or you could be deontological like Kant and formulate this in a kind of a categorical imperative. Each, I think, will work. The third premise is the legal premise. It's about the function of the law. It says the law must protect the most basic human rights of all citizens. Well, if all humans are human, and if all humans have a right to life, and if the law must protect human rights, then the law must protect the right of all humans to life. Self-defense is not excluded by this, because if my life is as valuable as yours, and you're starting to attack me, and you threaten to murder me, I have a right to defend my life, if necessary, by taking yours. In a sense, you have given up your right to life by threatening somebody else's. So defensive war is not outlawed by this. This is not a pacifistic premise. Now, there are three different kinds of pro-choicers. Those who deny the first premise, those who deny the second, and those who deny the third. Back in the 70s, shortly after Roe v. Wade, when philosophers started arguing about this even more than they did before... Most pro-choicers denied the first premise. They said either in a popular way that the thing you abort is only a potential person or only a potential human being, or they said it's only a bunch of cells, or it's human biologically, but it's not really a person with rights. That was the strategy. I think those arguments can all be answered, and 
maybe I should take the time to do that now, but I think I will not. I'll come back to that later. I think that position was sometimes honest. People who didn't know much about science read such arguments and said, well, yeah, that's not a human being, so what's the big deal about abortion? So their consciences were genuinely not troubled by it. I think that's due to scientific ignorance, and I think it's very obvious and very clear that from a scientific point of view, certainly from a genetic point of view, that little thing there is a very little human. It's not performing any human activities yet. It's not even feeling pain because it doesn't have a brain and nervous system. And it's certainly not reasoning or making free choices. But what it's doing is something that only a human being can do. It's growing a human brain and nervous system. So it's not a potential human being. It's a potential adult. When I'm sleeping, I'm a potential thinker. I can't think in my sleep, but I'm still a human. If you want to argue that the fetus is not human because it's not functioning in a human way, then your premise is whatever is not functioning in a human way is not at that time human, in which case in deep sleep you're not human and it's okay to murder you, which is an absurd conclusion. What fascinates me and frankly upsets me is that most philosophers now admit the truth of the first premise. Not all, but most. And most pro-choice arguments, in, from a philosophical point of view, that I am aware of, now question the second premise rather than the first. The reason that upsets me is because we expect all human beings not to be fundamentally morally ignorant. We don't expect all human beings to be not fundamentally scientifically ignorant. Scientific ignorance is a weakness of intellect, which may be excusable. But moral ignorance on a, a matter this basic is much less excusable. I was at a philosophy convention some years ago. Some of you know Father Kotursky from Fordham University. He was at the convention. He, there was a, an argument about euthanasia. And it was very similar to the abortion argument. Is it okay to kill people when they're in pain? Even without their consent, what about advanced Alzheimer's patients who didn't sign any form, didn't say, hey, when I get this bad, please kill me. You don't know what they'd want, but now they're incapable of that. And the person who was giving the paper was justifying killing Alzheimer's patients, even without their consent. And she used uh, analogies that I thought were rather chilling. She said, we don't treat any other species of animal in this special human way because we don't have sweet feelings for them. For instance, take mice. We divide all mice into three categories depending on how we feel about them. If we have a pet mouse, we feel in a semi-human way towards the mouse and we would feel guilty about killing it. If it's a laboratory mouse, we don't have any feelings towards it at all. It's simply an object and we kill it uh, if we think it's useful scientifically. And finally, mice in the wilderness, mice that are neither pets nor laboratory mice, we have no feelings towards, so we don't neither kill them nor forbid killing them. And then she said, I see absolutely no logical reason why we should not treat our own species in exactly the same way as we treat every other species. So let us divide all human beings into laboratory animals, which is right to kill for, for good reasons, like dying Alzheimer's patients. Maybe before you kill them, you can harvest their organs and people that you have feelings for, so it would hurt you emotionally to kill them, so don't kill them, and people you don't give a damn about. Nobody in the audience except two people reacted to that in any other way than just nodding and shaking their heads. One of them was Father Kotersky, who just sort of threw up his hands in despair, and the other was the only non-philosopher in the audience. They were all philosophers, most of them males, but uh, this lady was uh, obviously very Irish and very Catholic and very pregnant, and she had a baby with her. And she was middle-aged and red-haired. And she tried to argue with the lady, and she wasn't a very good philosopher. And I would have helped her, but I had to give a talk in two minutes. So I stayed as long as I could. And Father Katursky sort of said, forget it, they're not going to listen. Why do I tell that incident? Because I think that denying... Premise two is an extremely serious thing. And if that's a typical attitude, if that's a socially acceptable attitude, if that's what's being taught, I think we're in deep doo-doo. 
whether this is about abortion or genocide or, or anything else. So I'm going to argue about that one a little later, specifically. Third, the legal premise. It's fairly easy to deny the legal premise. I'm personally against abortion, but I wouldn't want to impose my will on others. Abortion is an ugly reality, but forbidding is even uglier. I want to ask those people, why is abortion ugly? Why are you personally against abortion? Just because there's blood there? Are you also against all surgery? If the reason you're against abortion is that you think it kills an innocent human being, how can you say you don't want to impose your will on others? What about slavery? I'm personally against slavery, but if you want to keep slaves, that's okay. I'm personally against rape, but I wouldn't want to see laws against it. Nobody says that. Because they are perfectly willing to specify why they're personally against it. So to be personally against abortion, but not to want to institutionalize that opposition by law presupposes, I think, that abortion is a purely subjective thing or a trivial thing, the kind of thing we wouldn't want to impose on other people. I hate Starbucks coffee, but I wouldn't want to forbid you to drink it. Well, I hate abortion, but I wouldn't want to forbid you to have one. Let's look at the argument, the essential argument that Roe v. Wade developed to justify this change of law. The argument is, we don't know when human life begins. This is a mystery. They didn't use the word mystery. That was Justice Anthony Kennedy later in the famous mystery passage in the Casey decision, which I've always thought was either the wisest or the strangest and most foolish thing anybody in the history of the Supreme Court has ever written. What it says is the most fundamental of human rights is the right to decide for oneself the meaning of life and the mystery of human existence, which is basically saying, hey, God, move over. You're in my seat. But I don't want to get into a religious argument here. The legal premise is simply that the most fundamental function of the law is to protect basic human rights. And the court said, we don't know if the fetus has a human right to life because we don't know if it's human. So from a legal point of view, we'll not legislate because we don't know. Now, that argument, we don't know when human life begins, therefore we shouldn't outlaw abortion, is a valid syllogism only if you add the implied premise. This is called an enthymeme in logic, a syllogism in which one premise is enthymemic or kept in mind. That's the literal meaning of the Greek enthymos. And what's kept in mind is the premise, if we don't know when human life begins, then we shouldn't outlaw abortion. That's the general principle. Then we don't know when human life begins, therefore we shouldn't outlaw abortion. That seems to me to be a very strange argument because both premises are false, not just one. First of all, as I pointed out before, we do know when human life begins. At least everybody did before 1972. It's not a controversial moral or legal question. It's simply a scientific fact. Secondly, uh, the principle that if we don't know when human life begins, we shouldn't outlaw abortion is a very strange principle. That's equivalent to saying, if I don't know whether you're a human being or not, it's okay for me to kill that thing that might be a human being, but it might not. Suppose somebody came into this room and I thought that it was probably an animal dressed in a human Halloween costume because it had a very, <laughs> very ugly face and, you know, weird shape. Uh, it just might be a president, but it might also be, <laughs> I'm not saying which one, uh, but it also might be just an animal. So if I don't like it and it's inconvenient to me, is it, is it okay for me to kill it? Well, of course not, because it might be a human being. You don't know. The fact that you don't know means don't shoot. The bush is moving. It might be a deer. It might be my fellow hunter. What do I do? Shoot. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm about to fumigate this whole building with a toxic chemical to kill the cockroaches. There are no cockroaches in Georgetown, are there? But I suspect there might be some students still here who didn't hear the uh, fire alarm. So am I going to search the building to make absolutely certain that there are no human beings here before I spray toxic chemicals? No, why bother? I don't know that there's, whether there's a human being here or not, so shoot. How absurd. Or you're driving home at night and you see something in the street 
it's an overcoat. It's an old, dirty overcoat, and it seems to be moving. It's a windy night, so maybe it's just wind moving the overcoat, but it seems to be crawling across the road. Isn't it funny that the wind can make it crawl like that? Maybe there's a human being there. Maybe he's an old drunk, but maybe not. Now, let's say it's going to cost you something to avoid running over it. Say you're going down the highway at 50 miles an hour and the thing suddenly appears in your headlights and the only way you can avoid running over it is by swerving. And if you swerve, you'll go off the road and maybe turn over and at least damage the car. Let's say you're not going to kill yourself, but a serious accident. You might even get injured. What do you do? Well, if there's some good reason to think that is probably a human being, don't, don't drive over it. Anyone who did drive over that or fumigate such a building or kill the thing in the Halloween costume could not plead ignorance. That's at least criminal negligence. So it's very strange that the court used the skeptical argument for abortion. I think the skeptical argument counts against abortion. Almost all pro-choicers that I know of resent pro-lifers for being dogmatic You say you know so much. You know that every human life begins at conception. I reply, no. Do you know that it doesn't? If we can agree to be skeptical, that's the strongest possible argument for not killing it. Well, since there's two issues here, namely, what is abortion and what is its victim and what is the fetus and is it human and does it have a right to life? That's one question, what is. The other question is how much we know. How much we can be certain of, how much we can prove. Put these two questions together and you get my quadrilemma. There are four possibilities because there's two variables. It's like Pascal's wager. You all know Pascal's wager. Pascal's almost a skeptic. He believes that you cannot logically prove that God exists or that he doesn't exist. But you have to choose to believe one way or the other because you're embarked on the voyage of life and you're going to die and you're either going to meet God or not. So uh, how do you choose? Well, he says, let's see. In objective fact, either God exists or he doesn't. And in my subjective experience, I will either choose to believe in him or not. So there's four possibilities. God exists and I believe in him. God exists and I don't believe in him. God doesn't exist and I believe that he does. God doesn't exist and I don't believe that he does. Well, in two of those four cases, I'm right. If there's a God, the theist is right. If there's no God, the atheist is right. Well, I've got a 50-50 chance of being right. And if I'm a skeptic, that doesn't decide me. Is it a good bet? You've got a 50-50 chance of winning $2 for your one. Do you bet a dollar? Yeah, maybe so, maybe not. Well, there's another bet. Let's look at happiness rather than truth because everybody wants both. Take truth first. Be honest. But if you honestly believe you don't know the truth, well, let's see what you can gain and lose in the way of happiness. If there's a God, and if you believe in him, what happiness are you going to get? Heaven. What's that? Infinite happiness. Oh, that's great. Yeah, but you're not sure. Well, let's see. If there is a God and you don't believe in him, what are you going to lose? Heaven. Infinite happiness. Oh, gee, that's terrible. Ah, but suppose there's no God, and you believe in him anyway. Well, then you're wrong, but nobody can prove that you're wrong. And there's nothing to gain or lose, because once you die, you die, and that's it. You're worms. There's no heaven and no hell. John Lennon is right. So is Vladimir Lennon. (laughs) Finally, fourth possibility, there's no God, and I don't believe in him. Well, you're right. You're one of the smart ones. You're one of the atheists. But it's not going to gain you anything in, in terms of happiness, because there's no payoff. When you're dead, you're dead. So the only chance for winning anything significant is combination one, God exists and you believe in him. The only combination for losing something is uh, combination number three, or was it two? My math is bad. God exists and I disbelieve in him. If God doesn't exist, nothing makes a difference. That's the Pascal wager. I don't want to argue that that's a valid argument or a good argument or an invalid argument or a bad argument, but you see it's a quadrilemma based on the intersection of two variables, the objective variable and the subjective variable. Either this is true or it isn't true, and either I believe it or I don't. So let's apply that to the question of abortion. In objective fact, either the pro-lifers are right and abortion is murder or something like it because the fetus is a human person with rights, including the right to life. That's the fundamental right. If you don't have life, you can't have liberty. 
Or maybe the fetus is not a person. Maybe the pro-choicer is right. At least the pro-choicer who denies the first premise of the three-premise pro-life argument. Maybe the fetus is something less than a human person. Maybe it's human but not a person. Maybe it's a person without rights. But it's not the full thing that the pro-lifer thinks it is. All right, those are two possibilities in objective fact. But here's the key to the argument. Let's factor in the subjective consciousness here. And let's not just talk about belief, but let's talk about knowledge. Because it's not belief, but knowledge that gives you responsibility. You either know what a fetus is or you don't. You're either skeptical and you say, I don't know whether it's human or not, or you don't know. All right, so there's four possibilities. The fetus is a person and you know it. The fetus is not a person and you know that. The fetus is a person and we don't know that. Excuse me, the fetus is not a person and you... <laughs> you see them up there. Either the fetus is a person and you know it, or it's a person and you don't know it, or it's not a person and you know it, and it's not a person and you don't know it. What is abortion in each of these four cases? Well, if the fetus is a person with rights, including a right to life, and you know that, and you nevertheless deliberately choose to kill it, that's the definition of murder. And if it's premeditated, that's first-degree murder. Oh, but it's such a small person. Haven't you read your Dr. Seuss? Horton hears a who. A person's a person no matter how small. Ah, but what if the fetus is not a person? Does that make abortion okay? Well, if you know that, yes. If the fetus is not a person and you know that for sure, then there's absolutely nothing wrong with abortion. It's, it's an operation. It's, it's excising some cells. And I've often honestly confessed that I would find it rather relieving if some pro-choice philosopher could prove to me, to my satisfaction, that we can know that the fetus is not a person. Then we could just give up and go home and agree to disagree and pack up. And we wouldn't have to have such expenditure of time and money and energy and worry about this whole question. That would make it a lot easier. But I've never seen it done. Never. So only if this thing were done that I've never seen done, is abortion okay? Because suppose you don't know what a fetus is. Let's look at the other two possibilities. You don't know that a fetus is a person, but in fact it is. Well, that's the don't shoot principle. You don't know that it's not a person. You don't know what it is. You shoot it anyway. You run over the coat. You shoot the leaf moving in the tree. And it, it happens to be your fellow hunter. Oh, I didn't mean to kill him. Yeah, but did you wait to see that that was a deer instead of your hunter? No, I didn't know what it was. And you shot anyway? You have killed a man. That's manslaughter. It's not first degree murder. You didn't intend murder. But you have killed a man. And you are responsible for that. That's a very serious crime. Well, suppose the fetus is not a person. Ah, but you don't know that. Suppose the Supreme Court is right. We don't know what a fetus is. And suppose the pro-choicers are right in saying a fetus is not a person. Even so, that's criminal negligence. You're just lucky. It happened to be a deer, but you didn't know that. It happened that there were no students left at Georgetown when you fumigated. You didn't know that. It happened that that was a cleverly disguised robot and not a human being that you killed walking into the room. But you didn't know that. That's certainly morally reprehensible. I don't know how to get out of that quadrilemma. The usual move that the pro-choice philosopher makes at this point is to say that just because the fetus is genetically and biologically a member of the human species and just because it has its own individual distinct genetic code, even as a blastocyst, that doesn't mean that it's a person with rights. Yeah, it's a human being, but it doesn't have rights. Ah. Well, then we have two very simply and clearly different philosophies of rights. Either all humans have rights or some humans have rights. Logically, it's got to be one or the other. If only some humans have rights, then some don't. And if you can label those humans that don't have rights, including the right to life, that justifies your killing them. The history of that second philosophy is rather dark. It includes Dred Scott, which said blacks are not fully human because they're property. 
Whites own property. They have a right to property, uh, and therefore they have legal rights. But since blacks are property and property can't have rights, Dred Scott must be returned to his owner. So whites have rights and blacks don't. Nobody wants to say that except to justify slavery. Or when the Nazis began their eugenics program, it was based on this famous book by the German doctors called Life Unworthy of Life. Look at these severely retarded people. Look at these imbeciles. Look at these mental idiots. How could you say that they have a right to life? It would only be compassionate to kill them. One of the most famous American jurists in history, Oliver Wendell Holmes, bought into some of that philosophy when he justified the Virginia compulsory sterilization law by using language that looked like it was copied from that book. And uh, Margaret Sanger, founder of Planned Parenthood, has also not only personally friendly with the Nazis at the time, but said things very similar to that, including racist things like more babies from the fit and fewer for the unfit. Well, this may shock us, but if you believe that only some humans have rights, it shouldn't logically shock you. The only way to overcome the shocking immorality of such actions is by philosophy one rather than two, to say that all humans have rights and not just some. In history, only when you want to do something bad to some human beings do you relabel them. Well, since rights come from persons, since persons have rights, uh, let's talk about the same thing in terms of persons. Many philosophers that are pro-choice argue, yes, they're human beings, but they're not persons. Only some human beings are persons with rights. Those that are fully functional, those that are adult, those that are rational, those that can interact with others, those that can contribute to society, those that you can recognize, those that are wanted, whatever the standard. A line is drawn between those human beings that do have a right to life and those human beings that do not have a right to life. And that line is always drawn by a human being who is alive and therefore powerful and has the power of life and death over this other human being who can be killed. So either all humans are persons or some humans are persons. I believe that all humans are persons. I believe the category of person is larger not smaller than the category humans. As a Christian, I believe that God is three persons. I also believe that angels are persons, persons without bodies. I also believe that it's possible that there are extraterrestrial persons of other species, biological species, but they're rational, they have self-consciousness, they have free choice and therefore moral responsibility. So E.T. is a person, whether he's real or fictional. But the pro-choice philosophy reverses that and says, no, only some humans are persons. The category person is a subdivision of humanity. It's smaller than humanity, not larger. To smoke out these positions this way, to state them that boldly and clearly, is at least a necessary preliminary to debating them. Two of my four arguments, I think, namely the three-step essential pro-life argument and the quadrilemma are not just clarifications but arguments. The other two are clarifications. If you want a complete, carefully worked out, well, fairly carefully worked out argument, read my book, Three Approaches to Abortion. The first essay is entitled The Apple Argument from Abortion, in which I argue from the premise that we know what an apple is to the conclusion that all human beings have a right to life. And I find in conversation and in reading that pro-choicers who do not believe that a fetus has a right to life usually back up to some step in the argument where they have to deny either that we know what an apple is or that we really know what an apple is or that we really know what an apple really is or that we really know what some things really are or that we know that what human beings are or that we know that we have human rights because we have human beings in other words, that morality is based on metaphysics. Metaphysics is simply the science of being or thinking about being. It's not a woo-woo science, except in Southern California. <laughs> no, seriously, the bookstores in California uh, put metaphysics under a subdivision of witchcraft. <laughs> but, <laughs> but metaphysics is simply thinking about what is. 
I don't think there's a very strong pro-life argument without metaphysics. I don't think there's a very strong moral argument for anything without metaphysics. Because the basic moral rule, it seems to me, is the three R rule, right response to reality. Why is it wrong to torture a pig? Because a pig has feelings. Oh. Why is it not wrong to torture a tulip? Because a tulip doesn't have feelings. Oh. Uh, Why is it wrong to kill a bald eagle? Well, because a bald eagle is in danger of extinction. Why is it okay to kill a mosquito? Because a mosquito is not in danger of extinction. You see, in each case, we're giving an argument in terms of metaphysics because of what it is. So why is it wrong to kill an innocent human being who is not threatening your life? Well, because of what a human being is. What's that? Is a human being simply what society says it is or what you want to say it is? Is it your will and your power that defines a human being or is it nature that defines a human being? You don't have to assume God. I don't think the argument against abortion depends on religion. I think atheists like Bernard Nathanson see this very clearly. As long as you're not a total skeptic, and even the skeptical argument counts against abortion, you can believe that human nature exists and we can know something about it, and that grounds human values. Human beings have human values because they're human. And different kinds of people have different rights and different duties because they're differently human. For instance, parents have parental rights because they're parents. They have, for instance, the right to forbid their 17-year-old child with a valid driver's license to drive his car because he's been driving irresponsibly. Non-parents don't have that right because they're not parents. Or you might argue the handicapped have a right to an elevator. Why? Because they're handicapped. In other words, rights depend on what it is. The easiest move for the pro-choicer to make at this point is some form of skepticism. Well, that's dogmatic. We really don't know human nature. We don't know what is. My two replies to that are, until we started to argue about abortion, you did think that you knew what things were. And in all other analogous moral areas, you act as if you do. And secondly, if you don't, then don't shoot. Well, I've shot. I ask at this point for questions. Yes. I know you didn't intend to do this, but you emphasize belief in knowing what human nature is and that human, humans have rights. And it seems that you sort of beg the question when giving, when telling us that humans have rights because of persons and the persons because of humans, et cetera. So what? This is about belief. This is about knowledge. Which one are we talking about? We're talking about... The last board? The last. Okay, fine. How could we demonstrate to someone that persons have the dignity that is worthy of rights? By analogy with what they will already admit. Almost almost everybody will, in some cases, admit that. For instance, suppose you're so ugly that you make me sick and you make me vomit and throw up. Do I have a right to kill you? (laughs) That's a reason. That's a reason. It's not arbitrary. Depends on... Nobody would say yes. I don't know. Some some consistent pro-abortionists would say yes. I don't think so. I've never heard one. Nobody wants to say that killing a human being is trivial. They want to say that abortion is trivial. So they want to say that somehow abortion is less than killing a human being. They argue. I don't know. There, there are current philosophers that, that argue like the protection of some like, pets and stuff would be more important than you know, a crippled human. Outfit. Yeah, Peter Singer. Yeah, Singer. Yeah. So He's the most famous philosopher in America. How would we deal with him? You know, you got me there. I must admit that after his famous article got circulated, I think it was in the New York Times Sunday Supplement, but uh, millions of people read it. It was a very shocking thing. He argued, basically, that uh, it's okay to kill grandma. And he said that parents ought to have a 30-day warranty on babies that they get from the hospital. If they don't like the baby, they should be able to kill it for 30 days because in all other stuff, you can bring it back. And you're not saddled with a lemon car, so why should you be saddled with a lemon kid? A very shocking article. Now, what the New York Times publishes usually elicits a lot of letters of response. A LexisNexis search for the next week discovered zero responses to that. Zero. Either everybody agreed with it, or nobody wants to talk about it, or it was censored. I don't know. So, you got me there. I have to answer this. How are you going to answer a moral idiot like Peter Singer? 
I'm not trying to be rhetorical and suggest that all pro-choices are moral idiots. I think Peter Singer is. It's absurd. He thinks you ought to feel guilty about spending more money on your own mother than on strangers. Well, he's consistent. He's consistent, yes. That's what makes him crazy. <laughs> crazy people are consistent. I am Jesus Christ. Oh, really? How come nobody believes in you? They didn't believe in him either. <laughs> <laughs> I am Napoleon. How come you're not out on a horse conquering the world? How come you're in this insane asylum in a padded cell in a straitjacket? Ah, that's exactly what you'd do to me if I was Napoleon. See, you're keeping me safe. See, that proves it. Crazy people can be very consistent. When you go into final causality, you discuss that, you know, every, uh, we see that we have an end, we act for an end. And so, uh, you know, like in the ethics, Aristotle's ethics, we see that acts make us more or less happy. So murder would make us less happy and direct us away from our, our end. So you'd have to ultimately tackle. Now this question, which I'm glad it came out, now this question is going to force an answer to me that I didn't intend to give, but I have to. I said at the beginning, this is going to be pure philosophy and not psychology. Can't do it. Sorry, can't hold the line there. When human beings argue, they don't argue simply as logical entities. They argue as human beings. So moral arguments are often analogical. That is, if Peter Singer, let's say, has no qualms of conscience about killing his grandmother, but he does have qualms of conscience about killing blue whales, then we can appeal to that. Ah, what, where, where does that conscience come from? You're still a human being. You have moral feelings about blue whales. Why? And then maybe on that basis, we can make an analogy between the whale and grandma, especially if grandma's overweight. Suppose, however, suppose that they insist on staying on the purely logical level of purely logical consistency and not appealing to that instinctive moral sense at all. Then I don't think you can have any moral argument. I've read too much science fiction to be naive about that. The bug-eyed monsters from outer space, they're much more brilliant than we are and they have no conscience. War of the Worlds. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're in the war of the worlds now and pro-lifers are aliens from Mars. But Peter Singer sometimes seems to approach that state. But I really don't think that most people are that morally blind. I think, in fact, I, I have massive evidence for the fact that most pro-choicers have a guilty conscience. Sure. But I think there's an answer somewhere. Oh, sure, there's an answer. So he's, he's either has an order or he's being inconsistent. But I think you can feel the he admitted that he was a hypocrite. He didn't practice what he preached. He put his mother in an expensive nursing home. He said justice would demand that that money was spread out equally among all the people that I know that have an equal need for nursing homes. You just brought up something about most people aren't that immoral. I'm trying to get back to your third precondition that... Wait, can you say it again? With his objective values? Right. Okay, so this is for people who are thinking about it from the beginning of life part. What about the people that don't really care about all this? They're like, well, even if they are, you know, the mother's life or whatever. Is more That's important. more crucial than argument because the power of facts to make people care is much more powerful than the power of logic to make people think differently. A visit to an abortion clinic, talking to some of the women who have had abortions, is a much more powerful, thought-changing and life-changing thing than brilliant, consistent arguments. And I think rightly so, because people realize that, especially philosophers, are very clever. And that doesn't mean that they're right. It only means that they're very, very good at hiding. In America, at least, and probably throughout the world, the likelihood of your being pro-choice is directly proportionate to the number of years you've been educated. PhDs are more pro-choice than MAs. MAs are more pro-choice than college graduates. College graduates are more pro-choice than high school graduates, et cetera, et cetera. Why is this? Well, I think it's very simple. The smarter you are, the more clever you are at hiding from yourself. A farmer can't not face the facts of abortion. You've got to be very clever to not know something. If I say to you, I command you not to think about a blue monkey, you can't stop thinking about a blue monkey. <laughs> unless, unless you're very clever... And you're a brilliant psychologist and you know how to distract yourself from that by something else. And you fill your mind with that something else and it works. But most people can't do that. You've got to be very brilliant. There was a Harvard sociologist who in the 80s or 90s made a study of the people who actually did the work in the Holocaust, in the death camps. And she paralleled it with their level of education. And she thought she was going to show 
statistically, that those who were more educated, whatever their beliefs for or against Hitler, were more reluctant to do the dirty work because they had sensitive consciences or at least sensitive feelings, and that the, the grunts, the pig-like people, did the dirty work. It was exactly the opposite. Exactly the opposite. The more educated you are, the more fanatically pro-Nazi you are because they were educated in Hitler's schools. Power of propaganda. A follow-up on that. Would that be true of the people that started the pro-choice movement? Were they a lot of uh, very educated people? I, I don't remember the history of it. But. I don't know enough to say that. I would suspect it, but I don't know. Yes. There are clinical scenarios where taking further down uh, women's pregnancy, if um, while in labor, a situation presents itself where maybe they might have to undergo a C-section or do some kind of procedure in order to save the baby's life. Not necessarily endangering the mother's life, but let's just say to save the baby, they would have to do a C-section. Mm -hmm. The mother at that time can refuse a C-section based on her own rights mm -hmm. as a person. Could not a pro-choice person take that argument and bring it back to this where you say every human has the right to life? So if at that point a woman can choose deny her child a right to life, could she not then once up? That's a legally gray area. That's a penumbra. Most of us think that it's right for the law to force people to help other people in emergencies, to be a good Samaritan in emergencies. But it's not a good idea for the law to force people to be more than a good Samaritan. And what's the difference? If I see a little child drowning in three feet of water, and I can go in and pull the child out with very little cost to myself, and I don't do it, I should be fine somehow. But if I'm not a very good swimmer, but I can swim, and I see somebody drowning in a swimming pool, and I'm a little afraid of water, and it would take a great coward not to jump in, but I don't jump in, should I be fined? Well, that's a legally gray area, I think. Uh, you said in the beginning of your talk that one of your key premises was we have to reject utilitarianism. But I was wondering if you think that a uh, utilitarian would have a strong argument against abortion in the sense that uh, if they argued that, for example, fetus couldn't suffer or that net suffering would be prevented or uh, decreased by going through an abortion, would that be a strong argument for you? Until roughly the sixth month, the utilitarian would have to be pro-choice because the brain and nervous system aren't well enough developed to have conscious pain. But a utilitarian who's a strictly Benthamite utilitarian who identifies happiness with pleasure can easily be refuted. How many people are there in this room? 80? All right, let's suppose I'm the only normal person in this room and you're all cannibals. And let's say it would increase your pleasure enormously for you to kill me and eat me. And it would detract from my pleasure. But 80 enormous bits of pleasure over here versus one bit of pain over here, it's a great thing to do. It would be wonderful for you to do that by utilitarian principles. So even most utilitarians have to modify that a bit. Yes? Um, I'm just playing the devil's advocate. But what would you say to people? At the very beginning, you said you mentioned the exception on the prohibition of killing in the case of self-defense. So what would you say to people who would like to argue that um, when the mother's life is at stake, abortion is a form of self-defense because the fetus is threatening the life of the mother. That's a reasonable argument. If it's one life or another, then sometimes you can use the principle of double effect. You're saving the life of the mother. You foresee that this is going to kill the baby, but there's no way to save them both. And if you do nothing, both will die. I think that's legitimate. Suppose a woman has uterine cancer and suppose it's spreading very fast and she's pregnant. And the only way to save her life is a hysterectomy. That's legitimate, even though you foresee that the baby will die. Because you don't intend the death of the baby, and the good that you do is as great as the evil that you do. And there's no other way to do the good. That's a rare case. So what if the baby would live but the mother would die? I don't think the law requires the mother to give up her life for the baby. And what's your view on that? Is one life more important? No, no one life is more important than another, but the one who can make the choice, I suppose, should be allowed by law to make the heroic choice or the less heroic choice. That's still not any kind of species of murder. That's not direct killing. It's not abortion. That's the same kind of judgment call as war. Is a certain war necessary? Hopefully not. It should be a last resort. I think Afghanistan was necessary. I don't think Iraq was necessary.
It's like capital punishment. Should you have it? Well, if you absolutely need it. I see no need for it in America anymore. To dovetail on your comment about heroism, I've heard the argument um, posed from those who are in favor of abortion in the case of rape or those types of situations, those extreme situations. I've heard um, pro-choice, people in that, in that position, or you know, people who are proponents of uh, abortion, I've heard them say, you know, you're calling the individual who possibly was raped or what have you, you're calling that individual to a higher moral state than maybe they are, or maybe that they can handle, or that you're calling them to a hero hero. Now, can you maybe explain what you think about that? Or? Yes, you are. Or rather, nature is, or fate, or God. If I have a non-terminal disease that makes me suffer a lot, and my pain can't be relieved, and the doctor says, well, if you just endure a few more months of pain, you can have a normal life, I'm called to a heroic thing. And I say, gee, I wish I would die. Can I kill myself? No. Why? First of all, because it's murder. Every life is valuable. Secondly, because a lot of other people love me and depend on me, and I'm harming them. So it takes an enormous amount of suffering and enduring that suffering, and therefore an enormous amount of courage for me to do the right thing. So it takes a lot of courage for a woman who's been raped not to have an abortion. But still, that's what a virtue is, something you ought to do, ought to have. How would you convince them? How would you convince them that that's yes, it's terrible, my agree it is? Oh, especially when you're talking about a virtue of, like, courage. Logic doesn't do very much. Examples do a lot. Talk to women who have made both choices. Talking to women who have had abortions afterwards and regret it. That's very powerful. I'm thinking about a philosopher like Judith Jarvis Thompson, who's going to acknowledge the humanity and personhood of the fetus, but she's going to say that though you have the right not to be killed, you don't have the right to demand resources from another human being, to which the pro-lifer might respond, well, this is a natural relationship, the maternal-fetal relationship. What's a non-dogmatic way to give credentials to the maternal-fetal relationship to show that it's distinct from, for instance, my neighbor demanding my kidney or what have you? That's a funny question because nobody doubts that unless they want to justify abortion. That's like saying, prove to me that that baby and that mother belong together. I guess if they don't see it, you have to argue by analogy. Let's say you're living in a rather primitive place. A baby is dropped at your door. There's no chance to uh, go to the hospital and, and give it a doctor's help. You're doing some important research work, let's say, and you really shouldn't leave it. But if you leave the baby, it's going to freeze to death. It's the middle of winter. What do you do? Do you take the baby in for a week and sacrifice your good for the baby? Of course you do. It's life versus research. So you could argue by analogy. But as I said, arguing from analogy is a way of trying to take a person who doesn't have the moral instincts to see the truth in this case and make it parallel to another case where hopefully he does have the moral instincts to see the truth. Couldn't she say that that's being a good Samaritan, but it's not required of you by, you know? Yeah, but most people have enough moral instincts to realize that in that case you ought to be a good Samaritan. You might not have to jump into the swimming pool and risk your life to save a little kid. Nobody would blame you very much for saying, gee, I could have saved him, but I'm so scared of water. But I think anybody would blame somebody for saying, I was writing a book and I needed time to myself, so I let the baby freeze to death. The argument that I hear a lot is, well, you can't expect somebody who's poor, there's all these poor people out there, and you can't expect them in their condition to have to bring the baby up. So doesn't that require somebody else to come in and help them? It's not just, you can't do that. Uh, You can't have that abortion. You can't... I said I wasn't going to use rhetoric and I wasn't going to use politics. I lied. (laughs) That is the snobbery of the socialist. It takes a village to raise a child. No, it doesn't. It takes a mother and hopefully a father. We can't expect this of the poor. Why? Because they're poor? As a matter of fact, there's a definite correlation also between riches and abortion. The richer you are, the more pro-choice you are. And I think there's a hidden racism here, too. It's hidden. It's not popular anymore. But, oh, we don't want too many of those people. Look, they're reproducing like flies. Hispanics, Muslims, blacks, you know, we're the superior. We don't say that, but the feeling is there. Read uh, Sam Harris's recent book, A Letter to a Christian Nation. It's incredibly snobbish. 
He says, well, there's two philosophies of life. There's the atheist philosophy of life, the secularist philosophy of life, which is enlightened and rational. And you see that in Scandinavia and Iceland and the Netherlands and Belgium and Germany and England. And then there's the, the rest of the world, which is religious and backward and poor and overpopulated. Which way will America go? I hope we go south rather than north. Because south values if I can use geographical terms here, are uh, faith and hope and love and community and family. And North values are money, sex and power and science and technology. So, yeah, which are more important? No contest. I was wondering, you had mentioned the principle of double effect earlier. Could you maybe explain um, the difference between a direct abortion and an indirect abortion? Because I think there was some confusion. Yeah. Cause we were, we're yeah, direct abortion is always wrong because it's intended. Even if the woman's life is in danger. Yeah, because unless there's some act other than abortion that saves the woman's life, you're not doing two things. You're doing only one thing. You're only having an abortion. And you may not do an evil act even for a good end. There may be some, many people who are starving and I could feed them all and save 10 lives by killing you and chopping you up and feeding your flesh to them. I may not do it, even though more good is done than harm because I'm directly doing an evil thing. But in most cases, when it's a question of the woman's life or the baby's life, it's double effect works because you're doing something other than just the abortion to save the woman's life. But it wouldn't be a direct abortion. It wouldn't be a direct abortion. It would be an indirect abortion. That's analogous to dropping a bomb on a, a nuclear arsenal, even though you see that there's a hospital nearby and there's collateral damage and a lot of innocent people are going to be killed, but you know that that enemy has his finger poised on the button. Two other points. I don't like the dichotomy between pro-life and pro-choice. I mean, it should be pro-life versus pro-abortion. Uh, I can explain why, but could you comment on that? Well, it's rhetoric. Pro-choice doesn't really mean pro-choice, it means pro-abortion. Moses put the two together in two words, choose life. So you could say, I'm pro-choice too. And frankly, if it were possible to ram a law through Congress that reversed Roe v. Wade today without changing any minds, I wouldn't want that strategy to happen. That's, not, that's the wrong way to do it. People have to want it. We're, we're in a democracy, we have to appeal to people, we have to educate them. We have to change hearts, not just laws. So it has to be chosen. So you would agree that we should make it pro-life, pro-abortion? Not pro... Excuse me? We should change the words to pro-life versus pro-abortion? Yeah. Well, that's a little unfair, too, because in a sense, everybody's pro-life. Pro-choicers say, oh, yes, human life is wonderful. That's why we're for abortion. Abortion increases the quality of life. Nobody says life stinks. If they do, they probably commit suicide. Nobody says choice stinks. If they do, they're a tyrant. So those are two rhetorically effective words that don't clearly define the issue. It should be pro-abortion, anti-abortion. I agree with, of course, the conclusion, but I'm wondering if the, the approach is as effective as it and it may not be as effective because people have forgotten that our final end is heaven. But if we recognize that our, our final end, as humans, we, we direct ourselves, we are directed towards an end that is happiness. And if we focus on the fact that murder does more harm to the person who murdered than the person who has been murdered, I think it would have an entirely different spin, which would, may not be as effective, but I think it's more accurate. I agree with you. But I don't think it's going to be very effective. Uh, I've noticed among my students, who are a pretty cross-section of decent people, that when we read a philosopher like Plato, who is very strong on that, uh, the Gorgias, for instance, a small minority of them are fascinated. They never came across that idea before, and, and this is a new dimension. Most of them just don't get it. What do you mean you're hurting yourself? How can you hurt yourself? They lost the idea of virtue. That's right. That's right. So you mentioned that we need to change like people's hearts before we can just change laws. So do you think it would be a good or a bad thing to make abortion illegal? Because that's one thing that people talk about. They don't... In itself, well, it's obviously a good thing. Okay. But I don't think timing it at a time when most people would oppose that change is a good strategy. But, I mean, wouldn't you categorize that as this, like, right now it's not? Or would you? That's another one of these penumbra judgment calls. Because on the one hand, if you have a law forbidding all abortions at any time, 
now or 10 years from now when 80% of the people favor it, when 50% of the people favor it, when 90% of the people favor it, when 2% of the people favor it, there's going to be some people that would be angry. So you can't please all of the people all the time. But at some point or other, it's obviously good to have that law because you're saving human lives. And saving human lives is terribly important. Well, isn't saving human lives more important than respecting human freedom? Well, yeah, yeah, life is more important than freedom. If I had to choose between murder and slavery, I'd choose slavery, okay? Well, then why shouldn't you impose that law by force now, if you can, just to save lives? Well, that's a judgment call. That's a pragmatic judgment call. I think the answer is because it would do more harm than good. In the end run, it would come back to haunt you. The sympathy factor would be gone. You'd be looked at as a tyrant. Right, and I was also wondering about you know, people that say that, well, if you make abortion illegal, then people will still do it, but they'll do it you know, in unsafe ways, or how would you respond to that? Well, that's true. The statistics are wildly overblown, but yes, there will be unsafe, dirty, back-alley abortions. Right. Just as there are now dirty, unsafe, back-alley assassinations. So should we make assassination clear and clean and safe? Anybody who wants to assassinate somebody else... <laughs> Let's bring him to uh, the safe area, what, Red Square, where there's free speech and free assassination. Yeah, I guess I just feel me, I mean, part of that argument might be that then you might be killing two people instead of one because, you know, then if the, you know, if the mother dies in an unsafe way or something like that. Well, I can use a reductio ad absurdum argument there. If that principle holds, then we ought to legalize all kinds of drugs because we can then, then ensure people that have free needles. And we should make prostitution available to everybody because we can make it medically safer. If we go from consensual to non-consensual, we could even justify anything. Rape. Let's have clean rapes instead of dirty rapes. And that's, that's totally absurd. Um, I have a question about how there can be a point at which we can determine the, the timing on such an issue when the, the time that it will Ask a psychologist and a politician, not a philosopher. Okay, yeah, but no, I was just going to raise the issue of Brown versus Board of Education. There was enormous discontent over that Supreme Court decision in the South. Um, but yeah, there's still, you know, I would say the right Good thing point. to do at the time. Good you know, point. So You've got to make a judgment call on where the conscience of the nation is. Now, the conscience of the nation right now is far more pro-life than the media would let on. And it's significantly more pro-life than it was 30 years ago. So the tide is turning. And that momentum is more important than the statistics. If you're a, a diver and you're in 20 feet of water, that's more serious than if you're in 10 feet of water. But I'd rather be in 20 feet of water going up than in 10 feet of water going down. Wouldn't it be a legal change that would permit laws to be passed, but there wouldn't probably be a national law? It would be back to the state It would be level. step by step, and the first step would be to reverse Roe v. Wade and let the states determine and allow states to prohibit abortion. It is right, because there's not going to be a law passed in the state that says abortion is no. illegal. No, no. But it's incremental. The law that Hadley Arcs got passed... I think that was the one that forbade partial birth abortion. That took enormous effort. And that was so basic, something like 90% of Americans favored it. So there were formidable political obstacles to even a minor change. It was going to take a long time. Well, maybe not. Maybe not. The abolition of slavery took not very long. And maybe even if there hadn't been a civil war, Lincoln might have got his way. We don't know. We do what we can. We've got a lot of different weapons. It's not a question of shall we use this one or that one. Shall we, shall we use litigation and should we use uh, the ballot box or should we use philosophy and education or should we use personal testimony? All of it. All of it, for goodness sakes. Oh, they said one more question. See, unlike heaven, question and answer sessions are finite and come to an end. <laughs> Do you think there's a philosophical way to prove that life begins at conception? Aristotle. No, I don't think there's a philosophical way to prove that life begins at conception. I think there's a scientific way to prove that life begins at conception. The confusion between philosophy, science, and religion is endemic in most people's minds today. For instance, the intelligent design movement, I think, is good philosophy but bad science. And it's paraded as science, and I don't think it's going to work. So we have to make a distinction between what can be proved by the scientific method 
what can be proved by good philosophical reasoning and what depends on a religious faith premise. Yeah, there should be no contradiction. Truth is truth, whether it's discovered by philosophy, by science, or by religion. But the methods of discovering it and the methods of proving it is different. It is a scientific fact that the life of each human being begins when growth begins. As soon as you have the zygote, that single cell, it replicates enormously and very quickly and in a specifically human way. So to say that's potential human life is simply scientifically untrue. If it's potentially human, what is it actually? Is it an ape? Aristotle thought so. Aristotle was responsible for some bad biology. He thought ontogeny recapitulated phylogeny, so you went through the different stages. You were a fish for a while, and then you were an amphibian. He also thought that a woman was not quite a man because she lacked one organ. So if you put her back in the womb and let her cook totally, she'd come out perfect. <laughs> so we, we mustn't uh, go back to bad biology. On that note, I think we can end. <laughs>